one more minute and we'll start. As I mentioned to you, um, we're going to have a really cool session today, which is basically a visit to a Gemini observatory in Hawaii. Gemini has two telescopes, one in Chile, one in Hawaii. And so basically it can, it can see the whole sky pretty much. I guess I don't need to be in the... All right, I guess we can start one minute before half past 12. So our host is Peter. Hello, Peter. Hello. So I'll just pass it on to you. Good day. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. How much time do we have today? Uh, 50 minutes. Five zero. Five, five zero. Five zero. Okay. Okay, I want to make sure that we have time for, for questions today as well, so I'll leave a little bit of time at the end for that. And um, what, what age are we, uh, are the students? This is, this is first, year, first year unit for all the, all the backgrounds, arts and science and everybody. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Uh, excellent. Okay, well, welcome, welcome to Hawaii, everybody. Uh, how many of you have been to Hawaii before? I fully yeah. once did. Okay. <laughs> did have, you, have any of you been to the Big Island? Yeah? No? Okay, so you saw the volcano and things like that. Did you get out and see the telescopes uh, up on uh, Mauna Kea? No, I didn't. No? Okay, good. So this will be new to everybody, I guess. Okay, great. Well, thank you for letting me uh, uh, join you today and uh, appreciate being able to uh, uh, time travel with you, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it's 3 o'clock on Tuesday here, so um, you guys are um, having your class right through lunchtime. You guys hungry? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, well, we'll, <laughs> um, well, again, what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about the Gemini Observatory, tell you some of the things we do here. Uh, we're coming to you uh, from the control room of uh, the Gemini North Telescope. Um, we have two telescopes, one of them here in Hawaii and the other one's in Chile. That way we can see both hemispheres. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go along and why that's important to us. Um, but <clears throat> our control room here in, in, in Hawaii is in the town of Hilo. And um, Hilo is the wettest city in the United States. We get about 150 inches of rain a year. Um, and uh, so that's a lot of rain. Uh, and you think that, what? Wow, geez, it's so wet there, why would it be such a great place for observing the sky? It must be cloudy a lot. Well, turns out that uh, most of the moisture drops onto us, and then it gets dry up on the mountain where the telescope is, and that's why they can see things so nicely up there. So we'll talk you know, a little bit about that, too, as we go along, but um, I want to give you a little bit of an orientation here before we go any further. Um, and to do that, I'm going to switch to a different view and show you a few pictures. Uh, and then I'll come back in a little bit and we'll uh, chat about a few other things. But let me see if I can make this work here, if I can press the right buttons. Um, you folks can hear me okay, yeah? Yep. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Okay, can you see something a little trickier up there now? Yeah. Okay, you were supposed to agree with that. <laughs> this, <laughs> uh, so this is the Gemini North Telescope at night. Take a look at this picture. Um, and I'm sure you understand what's going on there with the stars, right? Are the stars really moving? Uh, okay, this is a time exposure, right? It's called a star trail. And what we did is we kept the camera lens open for a while. Um, actually, it's a digital picture, so we took a whole bunch of short pictures and stacked them all up on top of each other uh, and made this image. As the Earth rotates, the stars appear to move, and we're looking towards the south from the Gemini North Telescope. Um, any guesses as to what those red lines are down there on the bottom? Yeah. It's not the volcano. Oh, yeah. You have to speak up. Because we have, the, only, the only microphone we have is this. You have to really be loud if you want to say something. There was suggestion that there were car lights. Yeah, exactly. Tail lights from a car. We don't let people drive around up on the mountain at night with their headlights on. 
So believe it or not, you have to drive drive around with uh, we call them parking lights here. I don't know, maybe that's I don't know what you call them there, but just the uh, directional lights basically. So that, uh, you have to drive with uh, very little light up on the mountain, but it's so dark that yeah, you can see pretty well. So the top of the mountain here, the top of Mauna Kea, where the telescope is is very, very dark. It's one of the darkest places on the planet. That's why it's such a great place uh, for looking up at the universe and studying the universe uh, here in Hawaii. In fact, Hawaii, um, although some astronomers might argue that Chile is about as good in some, in some ways, but Mauna Kea in Hawaii is really, we think, the best place on the planet uh, for looking at the universe. And that's why astronomers have built the biggest telescopes on the planet up there um, to look at the universe. And Gemini is one of them. The Gemini mirror that we use to collect light is uh, eight meters across. Okay? Uh, so I don't know how big that room is that you're in, but it would it would fit in that room, but there wouldn't be an uh, I, I'm guessing there wouldn't be a heck of a lot of space left uh, unless you put the mirror in there. And the reason we build these big mirrors is, is to collect as much light as we possibly can to see as far and as clearly into the universe as possible. We'll be taking a look at some of the things that we see a little bit a little bit later on. Um, now, you folks, I'm sure, know where all of these things are that we're talking about, but we've got Gemini North Telescope here in Hawaii, in the middle, middle of the Pacific, uh, the most remote land on our planet, um, and um, makes for very dark skies to study the universe. The other telescope is in Chile, in South America, and um, you can see about where it's located by that arrow. And collectively, those two telescopes can see both hemispheres of the Earth. But we're coming from Hawaii today, so we're going to focus a little bit more on uh, Hawaii since um, we're kind of a neighbor out there in the Pacific with, with, with you folks. And um, so you can see the island chain of Hawaii looking from space on a particularly clear day. Um, we don't get days quite this clear very often across the island chain. But I don't know if the resolution is, is, is sharp enough, but if you look down at the big island on the bottom, the biggest island, which is where we're coming from today, can you see a little red spot down there near the bottom of it on the right? Yeah, yeah. yeah a little bit? Okay, well, that red spot is a oh, rather intense heat source on our island, um, and you can probably guess what that is. That's a uh, volcano known as the Kilauea Volcano. It's uh, been active for almost 20 years now, the longest running volcano on our planet uh, currently, and uh, just keeps going and going and going and making all kinds of new land here on the Big Island. Uh, it's not really prime real estate. It's kind of rocky and, and hot, um, but um, it's making the island bigger all the time. Uh, the Big Island is the youngest geologically of all the islands, and the reason the other islands are smaller is because basically they, they, they actually sink over time, but they also have been eroded by the weather and uh, gotten smaller because of that. And so the Big Island is geologically very young, in fact, still being formed. We'll zoom in a little bit more on the Big Island. Now you can see where the volcano is probably a little bit more clearly down there on the lower right. Um, and um, you can also see that this is a, another very clear day on the island. There's just a few patchy clouds. There are two things that look like clouds near the middle of the picture, though, that aren't. Anybody have any guesses as to what we're looking at there? Snowcaps. Snow, snow caps, that we're saying? Yeah, exactly. Those are the uh, snow caps. On Mauna Kea, which is the tel where, the, where the telescopes are, where the observatories are, on the top, and then down below that is Mauna Loa, um, which is almost as high as Mauna Kea, um, the two largest volcanoes on our planet. In fact, Mauna Kea, if you were to look at it, if you were to drain the ocean away and look at it as a mountain from the bottom of the ocean, is the tallest mountain on our planet. When you look at Mauna Kea, you see about 14,000 feet, about um, 4,000 meters above sea level. We only see half of it. The other half is down below. Mauna Loa, same deal, same deal. But Mauna Loa is much broader and, and more gradual. And so it's the most massive mountain on our planet, Mauna Loa is. And Mauna Kea, being a little bit higher, is the highest mountain on our planet, 
measured from the bottom of the mountain or the, from the bottom of the ocean. If you think of it this way, those two mountains are kind of standing about waist deep in the middle, in the middle of the Pacific. You only see about half of them from the waist up. Uh, the rest of them is underwater. So there's a lot more that meets the eye, but they get high enough so that, um, believe it or not, we get snow uh, at the top. In fact, I was just up on the mountain yesterday, and there was some snow uh, snow yesterday as well. Uh, it's starting to go away. We're getting late in the season, but um, we've had a pretty good year for snow up there this year. Uh, people actually ski here in Hawaii, believe it or not. They go up on the mountain. Um, I wouldn't suggest doing it with your really expensive skis, because sometimes the ski, there's no, well, there's a lot of rocks and stuff. So, any of you ski? Anybody ski? Anybody ski? Any skiers? Yeah, a couple? Oh, no, not too many. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay, okay, good. Well, um, I, I wouldn't suggest that you come to Hawaii for the skiing, but if you do come during our winter, which is right now, um, there's a good chance you could actually ski on the mountain if, if, you, if, if you're really determined. In fact, what people like to do is they like to surf in the morning and ski in the afternoon so that they can say that they surfed and skied all on the same day. Um, Hawaii's, I don't know if it's the only place, but it's certainly one of the few places where you could do that uh, and just do it in an automobile driving up from sea level up to the top of Mauna Kea. It takes a couple of hours because one of the things that you have to do when you go up to that elevation is you have to acclimatize. Because when you go up to 14,000 feet, about 4,000 meters, the atmosphere is very, is very much thinner than it is. The air uh, there's not as much pressure in the atmosphere up there, and so the atmosphere doesn't push the oxygen into your blood um, as well as it does at sea level. And so you get about 40% less oxygen to your body. What do you think that does to you when you go up on the mountain? Anybody ever been to elevation like that and experienced what it's like to be at, uh, at an ele elevation like that? What's, what's the highest? What's the, I, I'm sorry, does anybody know what the highest mountain is in Australia?
Um, uh, just, it's me, Yasmina. I just want to ask you, because I observed La Silla, but I never observed it Mount Kia, and I heard from people who've been there that you can't actually see, when you go so high up the mountain, you can't actually see the stars because of the oxygen deprivation. Is that true? Very, that, you know, that's, a, that's a very good point. We didn't talk about that, but as, I, as we were talking, I was thinking whether I should bring that point up. <laughs> so I, just wanted to, I wanted to get it from the original source. Is that true or not? Uh, yeah, there's absolutely no question. When you look at the sky with your naked eye up on the top of Mauna Kea, you don't see the sky very well at all. Visually, it doesn't look like much because your eyes aren't getting enough oxygen and their sensitivity goes down. And it's different for different people, but when I look at the sky, it looks kind of washed out. You lose a lot of the contrast that you do. But you go down about to about the 9,000 foot level, and the 9,000 foot level, they have a, a place for the public to observe the sky, and the sky looks infinitely better when you're there. And it still is dark, and it's, 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 that's where the sky is most beautiful. Yet, with the naked eye, you don't want to observe the sky from on top of the mountain, because it, you'll be very disappointed. Okay? But the astronomers are not looking at the sky with their eyeballs. And all of the telescopes on Mauna Kea are using electronic detectors to study the universe. Basically, what we're doing is we're collecting light from space with big mirrors, focusing it on instruments, CCD detectors, like this, similar to the ones that you have in your camera, only these CCDs can cost $50,000, $60,000 a piece um, because they're scientific detectors, which are, have special properties. Um, but yeah, we collect the light from space, turn it into electrons, and then count the electrons and get the data. So basically what we're doing is we're collecting light and capturing it um, electronically on the from, from the telescopes. That's how they work. Astronomers never look through the telescopes on Mauna Kea. It's just not, not an efficient way to make observations. <laughs> um, because detectors are so much more sensitive, especially on Mauna Kea, where the human eye uh, really is kind of junk. It just doesn't work very well. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a very good, very good question. Um, and uh, we get a lot of disappointed people coming up to the top of the mountain and freezing, uh, freezing uh, in the cold air and, and not seeing very much, and then going down and seeing the sky much better. So uh, don't make that mistake. You can, you can avoid that mistake now. Uh, here's where we're coming from, our control, our, our base facility here in Hilo, Hawaii. I told you Hawaii, Hilo, is the wettest place in the United States. And how can you tell from this picture? By the ever-present rainbow over, over top of us. I, I, I'll assure you, though, there's no pot of gold over there. Uh, <laughs> observatories tend to run on, um, oh, we have enough money to operate, but we're not, um, Observatories don't have an awful lot of, uh, of resources sometimes, and so we need to make the most of what we've got. Uh, we wish there were a pot of gold over there, just under the building, but uh, we have a staff of about 160, 170 people that work to, to run the observatory between here and Chile. If you look up front, there, you see the flags there? Yep. There are seven different flags that the countries that contribute to Gemini uh, in order to operate. And Australia is one of them. If you look very carefully, you can see the third flag from the left. You see, can you make it out there? Yeah. Yes. Kind of? Sort of? A little bit? Okay. That um, Australia is a partner in Gemini, and uh, along with the United States, Canada, Australia, uh, again, Australia, Argentina, Brazil, and Chile all come together to, to um, allow us to operate. And again, the reason that we. Um, have two telescopes, and so we can see both hemispheres. Just uh, I mean, this is not to scale, by the way. We're slightly exaggerating the observatories on this animation, but uh, you can kind of tell as we flip around a little bit that uh, one telescope can see the northern hemisphere sky, and the other can see the southern hemisphere sky. Uh, but you can also see that we're on very different time zones. Uh, right now, it's a seven-hour difference between the two telescopes, so we really don't have very much overlap when it's nighttime with both telescopes. And so we uh, very rarely, if ever, uh, observe the same object at the same time. 
And so we're making different observations. Here we have different types of instruments on each telescope that allow us to see things in different ways. Uh, the Gemini telescopes look at the universe in optical light. Optical light is the same type of light that your eyes are sensitive to. And also in the infrared, infrared radiation. Can anybody, anybody have any, um, oh, how would you describe infrared radiation? Have you studied this at all? Or is that, uh, yeah. yeah, okay, so anybody want to describe what, what I'm talking about when I say infrared uh, light or radiation? Yes, we, we have a student who's coming down to the camera. Okay, we've got the expert here on, on mountains and infrared. <laughs> <laughs> it's a heat radiation. Yeah, heat radiation. We're looking at heat from space. Very good, okay? Excellent. So when we're looking at heat from space, <coughs> We need to keep the instruments very cold so that the heat from the instrument doesn't interfere with what we're observing. It's kind of like if you had a camera looking at visible light that you saw, optical light that you see with your eyes, and there was a flashlight shining on the detector, um, you wouldn't be able to see anything because it would interfere. Same thing when we're looking at heat from space. We have to keep the instruments very cold so the heat from the instrument doesn't um, um, block out the light from what we're seeing in space. And so uh, the two telescopes can look at a big section of the infrared, of the uh, uh, electromagnetic spectrum, the optical through the infrared. We do imaging, we take pictures of things, but we also do something called spectroscopy. And um, have you studied that at all? Is that something that you um, yeah. talked about? Is, yes, yes, yeah. we did. Yeah, okay, okay. So we break the light up into a rainbow of colors, yeah, and we study the intensity of those different colors. And from the difference in the intensity of those different colors, we can tell an awful lot about the properties of objects out in space. Everything from chemical composition, temperature, velocity. Um, we, can, we can ascertain an awful lot of information from, from the spectra or taking spectra of objects in space. And so that's a very powerful tool, and it's a big part of what, what any astronomical observatory does now uh, in studying the universe. Let's just tell a little, I'm sorry, let's just get away from the uh, telescope for a little while, and let's talk about where we are here uh, on the big island of Hawaii. I guess you can all recognize what this is. This is one of our, one of our famous volcanoes, Kilauea volcano, uh, during one of its active phases. Um, fortunately, right now, anyway, it hasn't always been the case, but the Kilauea volcano is uh, fairly calm and, 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 and very gentle. Um, lava comes up from it and flows out uh, and oozes into the ocean and makes new land. Uh, it typically moves pretty slow. Uh, in fact, one of the favorite things for tourists to do is to go stand near the lava flow and put a stick in it and burn it throw coins into it and watch them burst into flames and things like that. Probably the, the U.S. government doesn't care very much about that um, when, we, when we put coins in there. But and we, regardless, it's a pretty tame volcano and we can get close to it. It's very hot. Uh, people have suffered very bad fates getting, getting too close to it. Uh, it can be dangerous. We have a lot of um, earthquakes and, and, and tectonic, not tectonic, but we have a lot of um, Oh, um, well, earthquakes and, and, and uh, uh, geological motions <laughs> here on the big island. Things changing very quickly and dynamically, um, having the volcano so nearby. But uh, uh, it is nice because you can get fairly close to it. Uh, it's one of the few volcanoes in the world that you can get so close to. And here's another lava flow. And photographers love it. If you like, if you if you like photography. Uh, the big island and the volcano is very photogenic, um, especially when the lava starts flowing into the ocean. And that's what we're looking at here: is the lava flowing into the ocean and uh, steaming up as the uh, as it as it goes into the water, uh, making uh, making new real estate here on the big island. Now, one of the things that we I showed you before is the snow on the mountain. It's something that people don't usually expect to see in Hawaii. And the other thing that happens when we get tourists coming here, going up on the mountain. In, in our winter time, which is right now, um, the um, or actually with spring, I guess technically, but uh, we still have snow on the on, on the summit area. But this is what it might look like. In fact, if you watch our webcams uh, from the mountain, we have dozens of webcams up on the mountain from all the different observatories. And you can track the weather. Uh, 
this is a view from the webcam looking at the Gemini telescope. Uh, actually, this is an old picture from 2011, but it's uh, taken on April 7th. Um, and so it's actually later in the, in the, in the year than it, than, than it is right now. Uh, but on April 7th, we took that picture of a, of a snowstorm that hit. Um, this past winter, we had one storm where we had, um, oh, I think it wasn't all that much snow. It was maybe, um, oh, uh, maybe 10 centimeters or so, I think. Or five, no, five or six centimeters. Uh, but we had winds over uh, about 150 miles an hour. And I don't know what that is. I, 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 I'm really bad with my conversions. I'm sorry about that. Um, but it was uh, hurricane strength winds, basically, up on the mountain. And we get those every year. We'll, we'll get a storm every winter when the winds get that strong. So all of the telescopes are designed to withstand very extreme weather. Stre extreme weather that you wouldn't expect to get in Hawaii. And this is an example of what it looks like up there after one of the snowstorms. This is what it looks like from down below after it snows. It's just beautiful. Uh, you can stand down in a tropical environment and look up at the top of the mountain and see snow. So going from the tropical beach front um, uh, environment in Hilo, all the way up to the top of the mountain, you go through, I think it's five or seven climate zones on the way up. Um, and, uh, and you can see up on the top, uh, it's quite wintry looking up there. And the snow actually comes down quite a distance sometimes uh, from the top. But you can see exactly where the freezing line was there when we had that, uh, that, snow, that particular snowstorm. Um, and um, very, quite a beautiful sight when we get snow. Oh, the wind, my, my consultant sitting with me, I'll introduce you to it a little bit. Uh, he said 150 miles an hour is about 220 kilometers per hour uh, winds. So, next time I do this, I'm going to have to have a little cheat sheet. So. <laughs> so, the winds can get pretty strong. And here's an example here just after a snowstorm with the Gemini telescope. And you can see that when it gets like this, we're not going to be observing anytime soon. Um, the snow plows, believe it or not, there are snow plows in Hawaii, will come up and get the snow all out of the way. People will go up on the dome and shovel the snow off the dome because oftentimes when we get a big snowstorm like this, the next thing that will happen is we'll clear up and we'll have a beautiful sky. And there's nothing astronomers hate more than to not be able to use their telescope when the sky is clear. And so every night of the year that we can be on the sky, every holiday, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year if we could, if we were clear of that often, which you know, about three fourths of the time it is, uh, we're on the sky looking. And so when we get conditions like this where we can't get to the telescope, um, they're in a hurry to get, get it cleared up so that we can get, on, get the telescope back on the sky again and, and start observing. Um, it's estimated that uh, the value of a night on a telescope like Gemini is about, about 50 to 60,000 US dollars, um, just from what it costs to operate the telescope and all. So if we miss a night, uh, we're missing uh, a very valuable commodity when it comes to uh, studying, the, studying the universe. And so uh, we work very hard to get back on the sky when we get weather like this. Anybody have any guesses as to how something like this happens? This is after a, 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 an ice storm with a lot of wind. And this is this big thing standing up here is a weather tower with ice on it. How do you think the ice forms like that? That's uh, high velocity wind. Any thoughts? Sorry, sorry. High velocity wind. Um, high velocity wind. Yeah, they, yeah, exactly. What's happening in a storm like this is we're in the cloud, and the, the moisture from the cloud builds up uh, one little droplet at a time and freezes on the, on the weather tower. And so you can tell the direction of the wind is basically coming from the left in this, in this photograph here, building up over time. And I will tell you that standing underneath this weather tower is someplace you don't want to be when the sun comes out. Uh, <laughs> there's an awful lot of ice there that needs to fall off the weather tower once it starts warming up. And so it can be kind of, kind of exciting to watch it fall off the weather tower. <laughs> um, there's an awful lot of mass building up there in the ice. So pretty extreme conditions up on the mountain 
uh, when, when we get uh, this kind of weather. But when we get a nice clear night, this is what it looks like inside the telescope looking out. The telescope here is looking through uh, in the center of view today, the observing slit, which is what we look through. But on the sides, you can see it's open and you can see the sunset out there and the pretty colors of the sunset. Those are the ventilation gates. And what we do is we open up the side of the dome so that the air can flow through the observatory and get everything to the same temperature. We want everything to be typically about freezing is the average temp temperature up on the mountain, about the freezing temperature of water, 0 C or 32 uh, Fahrenheit. Um, so it's fairly cold and the wind can blow in there. So it's, it's, it's not a very pleasant place to be. When the astronomers are running the telescope, they're either sitting where I am right now, here in our control room at sea level, or they're in the control room up on the mountain observing up there as well, or both. And uh, so they have a heated room to sit in, but it can be very cold up uh, with the vent gates open and the wind blowing through because we purposely try to keep everything at the nighttime temperature. The reason for that is because if you get warm air mixing with cold air, the warm air is less dense than the cold air. So when light goes through it, it gets bent by the different densities of air. And when the light gets bent, what do you think that does to our view of the universe? It gets distorted. It gets distorted, we had an answer. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Distortion and twinkling. Exactly, we get distortion, and that's what causes the twinkling of the stars. When you look at the stars at night, if you are above the Earth's atmosphere, or if the atmosphere were a perfectly uniform temperature and didn't have warm air mixing with cold air, the stars wouldn't twinkle. But because warm air mixes with cold air, same thing you feel in an airplane when you're flying, right? That turbulence, it causes the light to get bent by uh, the Earth's atmosphere, it blurs our view. I'm going to tell you in a few minutes about the technology that we use where we can actually take out a lot of that distortion by the atmosphere. It's really an amazing technology. Um, we'll, we'll get there in just a moment. Here's what the telescope looks like under the Milky Way. Most of you have been out under a dark night sky um, and seen the Milky Way in the sky? Yeah. yeah. One time or another? You folks live in an area where you can get away from the city from city lights pretty pretty easily? Yeah. Or is it are you getting all the ways? Yeah, yeah. Because Australia has some beautiful skies. I know that I, I about 20 years ago I traveled with my uh, some friends and I with our telescopes, a bunch of astronomy nerds, uh, went down to Australia and uh, uh, went out in the country and boy we saw some beautiful skies out there. You guys, you guys are really lucky to have such beautiful skies so accessible. Um, you don't have to uh, suffocate with the thin air. <laughs> so, but if you, if you ever get a chance to get away from the city lights and look at the Milky Way, um, this is what it looks like under the telescope, under Gemini. One of the things you'll notice about this picture is it looks like the dome kind of went away and the, and the telescope is just sitting out there in the open. Actually, the way we did that is when we took the picture, we rotated the dome around and um, sort of painted the uh, uh, photographically painted the, the telescope by moving the dome and then showing the whole thing as the dome uh, slipped, rotated past. And so it's sort of an artificial way of showing the whole telescope and making the dome look like it's transparent. But you can see the telescope inside. To give you a sense of the scale of the telescope, I told you the mirror is eight meters across. The height of the telescope is about seven stories high. So think of a seven story building, uh, perhaps, in your community. Um, that's how high the telescope is. So it's not a trivial little piece of equipment. Um, these, these telescopes are big, and we need them to be that way so we can collect as much light as possible and see things as clearly as possible in the universe. Well, here's what the mirror looks like. Uh, that's a guy in the middle of the mirror inspecting it the long ago. This, but this picture was taken when we first put a reflective coating of metal on the mirror a long, long time ago, about 12 years ago. It was the first time we ever did that when the, when the telescope started working, um, or was first being assembled on the mountain about 12 years ago. Now, take a look at this photograph here. This is a fisheye camera view of the telescope. And if you look at the telescope, can you see that yellow line sort of shooting up from the center of the telescope there? Yeah. yeah. See that yellow thing going up, up into the sky? Yeah. 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 
If you see that? Okay. That is a laser beam. It's a sodium laser. Have you ever seen sodium, uh, low pressure sodium street lights, those orange street lights? We have them a lot in the U.S. I don't know, maybe I'm not sure if you have the sodium street lights. The same color as those orange street lights you might see. Uh, it's a sodium laser, and the reason we use a sodium laser like this is to take out distortions in the atmosphere. Now, I'll explain how that works in just a moment. But in order to do that, we need to have a star, a reference star, very close to the object that we want to study. Okay? And the technology that we use is called adaptive optics. Okay? Adaptive optics allows us to take out distortions from the Earth's atmosphere and see things with amazing clarity, see things very, very sharply in the universe. In fact, because a telescope like Gemini is so large, much larger than the Hubble Space Telescope, we can actually see things with higher detail than the Hubble Space Telescope can see from space using this technology called adaptive optics. And to do that, we use a laser to make an artificial star in the sky. And we use that as a reference in order to correct our view of the universe. The way it works is that laser propagates up into the sky about 90 kilometers up overhead. About 90 kilometers up, there's a layer of sodium up there. Okay? Now, sodium has been left behind by meteors, shooting stars, as they're commonly called, meteors that burn up in the atmosphere and they leave behind sodium. And what do you think happens when, a, when sodium light hits sodium atoms in the atmosphere? They absorb it? Any thoughts on that, maybe from what you've studied? Wait, it absorbs it and reemits it? We had that answer that it gets absorbed. The sodium gets yeah, it gets absorbed, and almost as soon as it gets absorbed, something else happens. It re-emits it. It, it re Excellent. Yeah, re yeah, it gets re-emitted. Yeah, that's what I heard, yeah? Yep. Yeah. It gets re-emitted in all directions, and so basically what that does is it allows us to make an artificial star anywhere in the sky that we want it, about 90 kilometers up. And we can use that artificial star to make corrections to fix the distortions due to the Earth's atmosphere. Believe it or not, there's not enough stars in the sky for astronomers. We have to make more. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is because we need one close to the object that we're looking at. This is what it looks like at night as it's scanning across the sky. This is a time exposure of about 10 minutes. You can see how it moves over the course of 10 minutes as it sweeps across the sky. Uh, following the same point in the sky, basically. This is what it looks like over the course of a night. This is one of my favorite photographs. Over towards the left, the very left, you see that bright arc over there? That, that's the moon setting. Okay, so the moon sets, and then over on the left, you can see a little glow on the horizon. That's the twi that's twilight of the from the setting sun. And then over on the right-hand side of the image, you see a bunch of lights from cars over there over the course of the night. But you can see the glow of sunrise over there. So you can see sunrise to sunset, and then the stars as they appear to move during the course of one night on the mountain. And you can see how the laser has moved in the sky during the entire night uh, using the telescope. We call this the, uh, the Mohawk uh, image of Gemini. It looks like the Mohawk haircut, so kind of. <laughs> I don't know. Do, do, do those still see those? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, there we go. Let me show you some of the types of things that we can see using some of these technologies and using telescopes like Gemini. Um, just check my time. I want to make sure we still have enough time. We all know what this is. This is the planet Saturn. Uh, this is using adaptive optics to get that really sharp view that I just mentioned. Uh, but then down below, you see that little, little dot down there below? Yeah. That's the moon of Saturn called Titan. And if we zoom in on that, we can, we can look at the atmosphere of, of Saturn's moon Titan. You see that, that bright spot there? That's a storm in the clouds of Titan. We can actually monitor the weather on the moon of another planet 
using this adaptive optics technology. That's how clearly we can see the universe uh, using this technology. Here's the planet Jupiter. And this is an infrared image, of, and as was Jupiter, as was Saturn. Um, and you can see the colors are a little bit different than you would see um, in an optical image. But that white spot there is the great red spot. If you look just below it, there's another, another spot down below that. And that was back several years ago, there were two spots, and that was called Red Spot Junior. And it, since, it, it has since gone away. But the red spot, that, which is the white spot here, is a hurricane. You can fit three Earths inside of that hurricane. It's been in the clouds of Jupiter ever since Galileo first looked at Jupiter over 400 years ago. So it's a long-standing weather pattern in the clouds of Jupiter. Uh, sometimes it gets brighter and dimmer, but it's always there, that hurricane in the clouds of Jupiter. Um, the Great Red Spot. One of the other types of things that we observe, and this is a little hard to see, but on this image here at the very center, you can see that there's sort of a yellow-orange area there. We're looking at the clouds of Jupiter, and what that that, that bright spot is down there, again, the very center of the image, down at the bottom of the disk of Jupiter, is where a comet collided with Jupiter and heated up the atmosphere. And that's what we're looking at there, is the, that little spot, that infrared heat that was given off when the comet burned up in the atmosphere of Jupiter. So we can study things like that uh, using, again, the, this technology. This is an infrared image uh, as well, so we're looking at heat in the clouds in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Now, from our own, our own solar system, we can go out and we can take a look at other solar systems in space. And in fact, Gemini was the first telescope to directly image a planet around another star. And that's what we're looking at right here. At about uh, 10 or 11 o'clock, about 11 o'clock, I guess, on this image. You see that spot up there? This star is quite similar to our sun, a little bit more massive, um, but you can see the planet up there uh, quite easily. Uh, that planet is about nine times the mass of Jupiter, so it's still a very large planet, but we can see planets directly around other stars, which uh, uh, is particularly exciting. And, okay, so there's that one. Here's another one. If you look at this one, you can see that there are three planets. Actually, there are four planets around this one. Uh, the other one's a little hard to see. You can see three planets very easily around this star. Uh, the star has been blocked out, by the way, a big black, so they're going to interfere with the light from the planets. And so directly imaging planets around other stars is something that we're doing now quite routinely at Gemini. And this is what an artist thinks it might look like. We didn't actually see it in that kind of detail, but uh, an, an artist looked at the data and said, hmm, this is what this might look like if, I were to go, if we were to go there and look at it. Uh, these planets are still fairly large and quite warm. That's why we can see them, because they're quite warm. They're larger than Jupiter. Uh, in, the, in the blue image, they're the largest planets, I think about four times the mass of Jupiter. And one of the things that, that is coming up for Gemini uh, is a new instrument that we're just finishing up right now, getting ready to work, called the Gemini Planet Imager, or GPI, GPI, Gemini Planet Imager. And these are the first light images from the Gemini Planet Imager. Uh, the top one there on the left, you can see the planet. Again, the, the star has been blocked, so it doesn't, you don't see the light from the star. It's that little hole there in the middle. You can see the star off to, at about you know, 4 o'clock. And then down below, you can see a, um, a system where there's a ring of dust around the star. And especially on the right here, if you can see that ring of dust, uh, where a planetary system we think is forming. And this is what the instrument looks like. It's uh, that instrument down on the bottom. Um, there are several instruments in this picture. This is the bottom of the telescope where the instruments are located. And you can see a person standing there for scale. And we just had... Uh, oh, we're just finishing up commissioning on this instrument, and when we got first light with this instrument, we had a, a whole, the whole instrument team, which is dozens of people, were up on the mountain working with the instrument, and this is what they did when they got the, got the first images with the, uh, with the instrument. So they were very excited uh, to be getting these, these images of other planets around other stars. We expect that this instrument, the Gemini Planet Imager, is going to revolutionize our understanding of planet, exo, what are called exoplanets or planets around other stars. So we're very excited about the possibility uh, of being able to find uh, ever smaller planets around other stars. Currently, 
we can fairly routinely see planets that are uh, Jupiter size and larger around other stars. But what we'd like to do is start finding smaller and smaller planets and seeing them directly and studying them and being able to characterize <coughs> planets perhaps <coughs> someday as small as the Earth around other stars, and especially planets that are in what's called the habitable zone, which is um, at the distance from a star where water basically uh, doesn't boil away, it doesn't freeze. So it's uh, conducive to life, just uh, to life, just like here on the Earth. And so we're uh, quite confident that those types of planets exist, but we need the technology to study them. And so we're, we're moving in that direction, but it's still going to be a ways off. I suspect that it will be in your lifetimes, though, uh, for students like you, when we'll be um, um, routinely finding Earth-like planets out in space. I, I can't imagine that uh, um, they'll be able to hide from us forever. <laughs> and um, just a few more beautiful pictures here of some of the things that we look at. Um, and we're running out of time, so I'm going to speed through a few of these. Uh, some star forming regions, uh, clouds of gas and dust where stars are clumping together, and uh, most likely planetary systems. We think most stars out there have planets around them. And so it's probably uh, very, very common, if not inevitable, that almost every star out there has planets around them. We, we don't know for sure, but it sure looks that way. Looking at galaxies. Um, this is a, an example of galaxies colliding together um, and uh, forming all kinds of interesting shapes and, and uh, configurations. Um, well, this one here in the very center of that image, can you see a little red spot there? It doesn't look red to me, but uh, in, in what I'm seeing, but uh, um, maybe maybe it's just the way it's coming back. Um, but in the very center, there's a little spot right there. It's called the gamma ray burst, and um, Arguably, this is at least, if it's not the most distant single object we've ever seen, it's among the most distant objects we've ever seen in the universe. A gamma ray burst is a huge explosion in the early universe whose light is just getting to us now. And this particular object, the light was given off within half a billion years of the Big Bang. Okay? Uh, about <clears throat> over just a little over uh, 13 billion years ago, uh, we think the universe began, or at least what, what, what we see as our universe began, um, in, a, in a huge um, explosion, explosion, you can call it that, called the Big Bang. And uh, so we're looking at something that, uh, that happened within a half billion years of the Big Bang, so when the universe was very, very young. And so, because I want to leave a little bit of time for questions, I, I hope, I think we've left a little time, I'm going to end on this image here of Mauna Kea with star trails um, over looking towards the north and the north star up there. The Hawaiian name, by the way, for the north star is, I'm going to teach you one, two Hawaiian words. Hoku means star, and pa'a, P-A-A, means unmoving. And the north star sits right over the north pole of the earth, or within a half a degree anyway. And, um, um, so it doesn't appear to move as the Earth rotates. And so we call it Hoku Pa, the unmoving star. Okay, so let's go back, come back to Hilo, get back in, in the view here. And um, do we have any time at all for questions, I hope? Yeah, we have, we have some time. Anybody want to ask any questions? Yeah, we got one. Come down to the camera. Oh, I'm sure that guy. <laughs> so we have a student coming down to ask questions because he has to come in. Oh, good, the excellent. Camera? The, the night hall guy. Um, how, uh, right. how many days a year uh, uh, you can't observe the sky, and what do you do in that time that you can't observe? Uh, good question. Um, we can observe about 80% of the time we can do something uh, in the sky. Often, sometimes the conditions aren't perfect, uh, or what we call photometric. Photometric means that there's basically no clouds in the sky, and it's just a beautiful sky. Um, that's maybe half of the time, and then again, about 80% of the time we can do something. There may be some clouds and uh things of that sort. You know, the other thing to take to keep it, to, 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 to take into account is that when the moon is in the sky, uh, the moon lights up the sky. And so typically when the moon's in the sky, we'll be observing infrared observations, 
When the moon is not in the sky, what we call dark time, we'll be observing optical, the same type of light that you see with your eyes. And so we have we do change our priorities depending upon not not just the weather, but also the moon phase too. That, that's also a factor uh, when we're making observations. But yeah, we can in, in Hawaii we can see we can make observations about eighty percent of the time. Uh, in Chile. It's a little bit lower than that, but um, uh, not much. It's, it's, um, we, get, we get about 75 to 80 percent of the time we can make those observations. What are you yes. Hi. What are you researching now? Um, what are we researching now? That's boy. That's a you know. That's that's a very difficult question to answer. <laughs> the way Gemini works is we use what's called Q scheduling, and so what we do is is We'll look at the weather for, for, in fact, right now we have our staff will be looking at the weather, look what it will look like tonight, and trying to figure out what the conditions will be like and what types of observations will be optimal for this type of weather. And so we may be observing um, you know, a high redshift galaxy at the edge of the universe, or we could be observing something in our solar system. We could observe, be observing um, an object in the Kuiper belt or, or one of or the, the weather around one of the, on one of the planets or uh, moons around one of the planets. Uh, we could be looking for exoplanets. It's a very wide range of things and it changes from night to night. So uh, one of the things that one of the things that we're, we're working on right now is a, I'm working on a press release that's coming out in about two weeks where we made some observations of a possible planet around another star that was discovered by the Kepler satellite. Have you all heard of the Kepler satellite? Okay. It's been discovering planets left and right out there in space. And so a telescope like Gemini will come in and we'll do follow-up observations to confirm or, or, or not uh, planets that Kepler thinks it's found. And so uh, we'll often verify observations by other telescopes as well, so we'll follow up on them. So everything from our own solar system, planets around other stars, to galaxies at the very end of the universe, we could observe any or all of those things in any one night. And we don't know until the night, that night what we're going to be observing oftentimes. So it's a, it's a very good question, but I, I'm afraid I don't have a, a really clear answer for that one. <laughs> All right, I think um, we'll, we'll thank you, Peter. It's, um, they have to rush to another um, class. Okay. So thank you so much. This, was, this, been, this has been a great, um, great session for us.